Coming up on this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, two leaked emails from Elon Musk detail the present day focus on the Model Y and the imminent focus on the Tesla Semi. Plus, Tesla releases its annual environment impact report and more. What's happening, friends? Welcome to episode 254 of Ride the Lightning for June 14th, 2020. Daisy the Boxer Puppy still awake for now, looking out the window to my left. Well, I have to say we're in mid-June now. Normally, we'd have already had the shareholder meeting. That would have happened either this week or last week. Typically, it's that it's the early in June, but obviously everything is uh, is thrown up in the air and, and changed with regard to, of course, the pandemic and the terrible situation that has just wreaked havoc across everything. So pushing back a Tesla shareholder meeting has been the least uh, of the inconveniences, but at least we do have that coming up in about, uh, what, two, three weeks now. Also, I was thinking this week, theoretically, Battery Day should be coming up soonish, according to Elon's last publicly given time frame on that. So I hope that happens soon, even if, like he said, it's just a live stream part one before they can do a part two in-person event at some point a little later in the year. All right, let me get to the news this week. There is plenty plenty to cover, as usual, with Tesla. Uh, I'd like to say, welcome to leaked Elon email week here on Ride the Lightning. There were two in two days on two significant topics. First up is an email that got around uh, an employee, a Tesla employee sent it to me as well before I saw it online in regards to the Tesla Semi. So here is what Elon had to say to the company on the subject of Tesla's upcoming Semi truck. He writes, it's time to go all out and bring the Tesla Semi to volume production. It's been in limited production so far, which has allowed us to improve many aspects of the design. Production of the battery and drivetrain would take place at Giga Nevada, with most of the other work probably occurring in other states. Jerome, and he's referring here to Jerome Guillen, the head of the semi-truck project at Tesla, Jerome and I are very excited to work with you to bring this amazing product to market with an exclamation mark, and that's the end of the letter. Well, a few things here. First, it seemed as though this email was was the catalyst for Tesla hitting its all-time high stock price this week, hitting a milestone as it surpassed $1,000 per share and closed on, uh, I can't remember if it was, I think it was Wednesday, at uh, about $1,025 or so. I mean, remember remember when the stock was soaring and Elon joked that it was so high when it hit $420? That was not that long ago, but that was $600 ago. It closed a little bit below the market, took a dip, uh, or at least Tesla did. Uh, they took a dip, I think, on everything on Thursday, but then Tesla closed the week 9.35. So, you know, welcome to the Tesla stock roller coaster. You know, I only pay uh, kind of casual attention to it, but yeah, from 1,025, two days later, down like 90 bucks to 9.35 where it closed out the week. But nevertheless, uh, just an incredible run of success, well-deserved, you know, the, the, the Fudsters, the, the people that want to see Tesla go under for whatever their, their selfish or nefarious reasons or, uh, are, they, I, hope, I hope all those shorts have, have lost a lot of money. At least the nefarious ones. I, know, I don't know much about trading, but I know that shorting stocks is a legitimate, un, you know, accepted method of, of, of uh, working the stock market. But I'm specifically talking about the people that are actively trying to spread misinformation and, and uh, 
smear campaigns and all th- those people can all lose <laughs> can all lose a bunch of money as far as I'm concerned. Uh, hopefully a lot of you in the in my audience made a lot of money on the stock this week. That is what I wish for all of you that have been believers and shareholders. All right, so my second thought about the Tesla semi, Elon saying, let's get it into production, volume production. Tesla has previously said with regard to the Tesla semi that they would be their own first customer, which uh, as I have talked about on the podcast before, I believe that's because they absolutely have to deliver a polished, fully featured product to their billion dollar corporate clients here. They cannot ship this thing in any sort of undercooked or beta form. They have to get it right. It's it's uh, going to be a, a, a key engine, uh, pardon the phrasing, within, within uh, the business of, of a lot of their clients here. So Um, But the thing is, if they're in limited, if they're really in limited production, they're hiding them very well. Because to my knowledge, nobody publicly has seen any Tesla semi-trucks besides the two prototypes that have been out there and working hard since the unveiling back in November of 2017. There's the silver one, and then there's the one that was originally matte black, which has uh, since been wrapped in a matte red. And those two semis have have basically been doing runs between the the factory in Fremont and uh, the Gigafactory in Reno, as well as going on promotional tours to go around uh, to be demoed to those those uh, corporate clients, those reservation holders. So those are the only two that, that I'm aware of and, and that have, to the best of my knowledge, have been publicly seen. So if they are in, if, if that's limited production, okay, I guess two technically is limited production, but perhaps there are more of them internally at Tesla. And the third thing, the, the third part of that email that jumped out at me is probably the same part that jumped out at you. And that is the part about where the Tesla Semi will be built. In fact, Tesla was, uh, excuse me, Elon was asked about that very thing on Twitter by Ride the Lightning listener Jason, to which Elon replied cryptically, we shall see, dot, dot, dot. So I have to tell you, I'm scratching my head a bit on this one. And if I'm missing something obvious, please feel free to drop me an email teslapodcast at gmail.com. I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to be Fremont. There's no room there to build a, to, to assemble giant semi-trucks. It doesn't sound like the whole thing is going to be built in Nevada based on his email. And then Gigafactory 5 in either Austin or Tulsa almost certainly wouldn't be open in time for the nearer term timeline that Elon seems to be suggesting with this. So will there be another smaller factory that's just for assembling the Tesla Semi somewhere? Could this somehow be related to the UK facility that the government there is trying to woo Tesla with that I talked about last week? I mean, I I run that scenario through my head, and to me, it seems like the geography on that would seem to not really make sense. Shipping out giant semi trucks off of the British Isles sounds rather expensive. I mean, I have to say, I'm fresh out of ideas of where this thing will be assembled. The the one dark horse wild card that came to mind, which I confess may be just completely wrong because I don't know what this facility is actually capable of, but Tesla does have a massive parts and distribution facility in Lathrop. California, which is about halfway between Fremont here and Reno, the Gigafactory. So I don't know, could they could they have space and be doing it there with the drivetrains and batteries coming down from uh, from from Giga? I don't know. So if you've got a theory on this, or better yet, a scoop, if you know something, please let me know, and I would love to pass that on to the Ride the Lightning audience. 
But that was the first interesting leaked Elon email of the week. How about another one? Uh, while Tesla will turn its you know forward-looking attention, as we learned there, to the semi-truck, the Model Y is now the top priority for today, for the present day. This, per a leaked company email from Elon Musk, the email was obtained by Business Insider. That's where uh, that's who first reported it. The email reads: Subject: Model Y production. Body of the email from Elon reads: Quote. It is extremely important for us to ramp up Model Y production and minimize rectification needs. I want you to know that it really makes a difference to Tesla right now. Model Y, especially GA, meaning General Assembly, is the top priority for both production and manufacturing engineering. GA4, that's the tent, that's uh, as far as I know, that's at least that's where my car was built, the, the Performance 3s. I don't know if they're still out there. I guess they're doing Ys out there now. I don't know if they're doing Ys and 3s or what, but anyway. GA4 is also top priority for facilities improvements. For those working in GA4, thank you for bearing with tough conditions. It will get better fast. I will be walking the line personally every week. We are doing reasonably well with S, X, and 3, but there are production and supply chain, uh, excuse me, Supply chain ramp challenges with Model Y, as is always the case for new products. Please let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Thanks, Elon. Uh, Business Insider adds a note here that's giving some action to Elon's words. They say, quote, Two Fremont factory employees who focus on Model 3 production told Business Insider that Tesla has at times taken workers from their teams and reassigned them to help with the Model Y, end quote there. Well, uh, a friend of mine who has an early VIN Model 3 just test drove the Model Y. So yes, the the Y is now uh, starting to be made available for test drives if you are interested I encourage you to, to uh, go on the Tesla.com website, fill out the test drive form, and they'll get you hooked up at your nearest Tesla uh, showroom or service center. Anyway, uh, this friend of mine who has an early VIN Model 3, well, he had an X prior to his 3, and he loved his Model X. And he'd been telling me that he's been waiting on an interior refresh, the same Model S and Model X interior refresh, we all think, (laughs) is imminent, but just keeps never happening. But he'd been waiting on that interior refresh of the X before going back and purchasing a new X. But this friend drove the Model Y. He test drove it, and he said he was extremely impressed with the Y. Now, yes, that's just one person, but when you have existing Tesla owners people who know these cars and have an expectation of what they are capable of and are sort of used to them, when the existing Tesla owners are blown away by the Model Y, just imagine the, the effect that the Model Y is going to have on the general public as it seeps out more and more into the wild. I mean, I talked last week about the glowing words from the Wall Street Journal and from Motor Trend, I mean, this thing, the Model Y, it probably is going to outsell the S3 and X combined, as Elon has suggested a number of times in the past. The only downside to that that I could see happen, though, is that I wonder if it's possible that the Model Y might end up cannibalizing sales of the Model 3 and actually causing Model 3 sales to dip a bit. I mean, Elon's prediction in that scenario would still be right, the Y could still outsell the S3 and X combined, but I wonder if it might work out that the the Model 3 number, as part of that outselling the other three combined, dips a bit. I mean, the the two cars really are, they are close in a lot of ways. And the Y sales are only going to increase not only as production ramps up and Tesla works through these early supply chain issues, but remember... The other, the other factor here that's going to have leave plenty of upside in Model Y sales potential is that next year we'll be getting the standard range Model Y, 
which will make that vehicle more affordable for many people, many families. I mean, I'll tell you, just anecdotally speaking, I definitely saw more Model 3s pop up in my workplace and in my neighborhood after the Standard Range Plus Model 3 came out last year. And of course, in doing so, brought the Model 3's base price. It, it brought made the Model 3 a $40,000 car, whereas previously it had been a $50,000 car. So, I mean, that's a lot of money. That's a, that's a major difference. And the Model Y is poised to get down to probably about $40,000 next year with that standard range model. With the Model 3, of course, starting a bit lower than that, it's at $38,000 now, and we'll see if it is if uh, Tesla is able to drop the price anymore between now and the release of the standard range Model Y. You know, another thing occurs to me, too, on this topic. I have to think that the Model Y is going to be in the mix for Motor Trend's Car of the Year award this year. Am I a biased fanboy? Yes, I am. I readily admit that. But (laughs) I still can't believe the Model 3 didn't win in 2017. The Model S won in 2012. But the 3 is every bit as significant and great of a car for what its goals are that, that, that the Model S was. I mean, I guess... You could argue that it didn't win because it wasn't really available to the general public in 2017 because the only people that were really getting Model 3s in 2017 were Tesla employees and the existing S and X owners who received priority. But the if you're wondering, Motor Trend Car of the Year 2017 went to the Alfa Romeo Giulia. I mean, no disrespect, no 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 disrespect to that car, but look at the sales figures. And look at the customer satisfaction on both of those cars. The Model 3 is going to go down in automotive history as an all-time game-changing car. It should have won, at least in my in my biased fanboy opinion. But at least Motor Trend has a chance to right that wrong here in 2020 if the Model Y ends up taking home the Car of the Year trophy. We shall see. Still a half a year to go. But again, I imagine it's got to be right in the mix, particularly after Model uh, Motor Trend's glowing review of it that I uh, told you about last week. Next up, speaking of the Model Y, that vehicle is now eligible for referral code usage along with the rest of the current Tesla lineup. So if you are buying a Model Y, please use someone's referral code, preferably not mine, so that the both uh, the both of you, whether it's a friend, family member, coworker, whatever, the both of you will each get 1,000 free supercharging miles. And in addition, you also go into a raffle for a monthly Model Y giveaway and a quarterly Roadster giveaway. So a little extra incentive there. Now, I don't imagine that this is any kind of red flag about about the Model Y, the fact that they're enabling referral code usage here, but rather my thinking is that Tesla is just trying to goose numbers in general a bit as the quarter is rapidly rushing to a close here. A quarter that I I need not remind you, I'm sure, Tesla lost the first half of this quarter due to the coronavirus shutdown. I mean, okay, yes, they still had Shanghai going, Giga 3, but uh, that that facility does less than half of the weekly production run rate that Fremont does. So again, uh, please do try to find someone else's code to use, not mine. Uh, the The referral program has been very, very good to me. I'm also very fortunate that I got my Model 3 in the very brief window where the Performance Model 3's got free unlimited supercharging for life. So uh, you're, the miles are wasted on me. Hopefully you can find, again, a friend, family member, coworker, somebody. But I'll, I'm just going to give mine in the event that you don't have anybody else in your life that has a code. So if you just need one to make sure that you get those supercharger miles, mine is, uh, well, actually, you have to use, you have to order through the referral link so that the, the uh, referral code is baked in. To my knowledge... 
Tesla is no longer allowing you to go back and retroactively add a code into the order. So you gotta order with it. So if you, again, last, use me as a last resort, but if you need mine, order through this link, ts.la slash Ryan73014. Uh, and finally, one more quick Model Y note. Canadian Model Y deliveries have started. So more good news on the subject of Model Y. Next this week, Tesla released their annual environmental impact report for 2019. It is long, it is dense. I encourage you to read the whole thing if you're curious, but I'll read you just a little bit here. From the report, quote, the very purpose of Tesla's existence is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. In furtherance of this mission, we are excited to publish our second annual impact report. Transparency and disclosure are important for our customers, employees, and shareholders, which is why we have expanded the impact, the impact report's content this year. Tesla aims to continue to increase the proportion of renewable energy usage at our factories in an effort to minimize the carbon footprint for every mile traveled by our products and their components in our supply chain. All of the factories that we built from the ground up, such as Gigafactory Nevada and Gigafactory Shanghai, and our forthcoming Gigafactories in Berlin and North America, are designed from the beginning to use energy from renewable sources. So a little section of this. Model Y, excuse me, Model 3 personal use that are uh, vehicles that are grid charged, which I think is probably what most of us are doing, although, hey, if you're, if you're charging via solar power, more power to you. I tip my cap. Literally more power to you. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this, this segment of data about personal use Model 3s, so not used for business, personal use Model 3s that are charged from the grid, those cars have a total average life cycle emissions. So this is including the manufacturing phase as well as the use phase when you have the car. That uh, usage is, that emissions is under 200 grams of CO2 per mile. In comparison, the average mid-sized premium internal combustion engine vehicle, as designated here by Consumer Reports, so basically other cars in Model 3's class, produce on average over 400, over 400, so under 200 versus over 400 grams of CO2 per mile. And Tesla here, they're doing their best to factor in everything, including charging losses uh, from the grid to the car, and they're averaging the nationwide grid based on where the, the they know that their cars are sold to, since, of course, some areas of the country have cleaner energy grids than others. Also, here's another interesting note. Since the Model 3 started production three years ago now, Tesla has improved emissions at the manufacturing phase by about 10%. That's great. Uh, now, this report also includes a section on battery recycling, which I know a lot of folks, including some fudsters, by the way, but more importantly, plenty of people who are genuinely innocently curious about what happens to these batteries after the cars, after they're done, that's in there. So if you end up taking a look at it, it's on page 14. Uh, the entire report is 57 pages long. It is quite comprehensive. Again, go check it out on Tesla's website if you're interested. You can find it on their investor relations site. You'll just see it. It's a, there's a PDF link right on the page, which and the link is IR, which stands for Investor Relations, ir.tesla.com. And finally this week, one other item worth mentioning here, a forum poster on the Tesla Motors Club forums claims that his service advisor said that the June onwards builds of the Model 3 here in Fremont have the revised Model Y center console with the built-in wireless phone charging pad and USB-C ports. Now, I say that delicately because I can't confirm it, and with all due respect, Tesla employees have, in time and 
here and there, been known to not always have the most accurate or correct information, even though they mean well. But this would not surprise me at all if this is accurate, and we should get confirmation of it pretty soon as the first June build cars start delivering. But uh, yeah, again, would not surprise me at all. I passed along the report, what, a few shows back now about the updated console showing up in the Shanghai build Model 3s. So if they're going into new build 3s in Fremont now, that would make perfect sense. That would mean presumably they've exhausted their supply of the original version of that center console. So if you just ordered a Model 3, you may want to check in with your service advisor and see what the build date of that vehicle is. And if you're interested in getting that wireless charging pad built in, as well as those USB-C ports, you may want to see if uh, you can politely request that you uh, get a newer build vehicle if, in fact, you have one that's, uh, that's, that has a build date of May 2020. So that's everything in the world of Tesla news for this week, but stick with me. I've got plenty more for you. Lots of your excellent phone calls, a lot of great topics to discuss in the Ride the Lightning hotline right after this word from a warthog Cybertruck driving Master Chief. This is Steve Downs. The voice of Master Chief, Sierra 117. You're listening to Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast. You know, that Cybertruck looks a lot like a warthog, doesn't it? Master Chief, out. Time for the Ride the Lightning hotline where I take your questions, comments, and discussion topics. You can call in in one of two easy ways. Either use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software, record me a question. Please try to keep it to 90 seconds or less so that I can get to as many calls each week as possible. And email that file to me at teslapodcast at gmail.com. Or you can take that same 90 second or less call and send it into the actual Ride the Lightning hotline. Dial it up anytime, toll free. It's 1-888-989-8752. Again, that's 1-888-989-TSLA. And by the way, if you know someone special with an upcoming birthday, anniversary, graduation, or some other special occasion, you can give them a unique gift of recorded voices from friends and family telling them why they're special. The recordings can be podcasted or put onto a keepsake, visit lifeonrecord.com to learn more. And a quick note, the, I forgot to mention this last week, I apologize, but the June Patreon exclusive bonus episode is up. That's where all the extra calls go that I cannot get to during the regular weekly shows. So if you hear your name right now uh, and you don't already support me on Patreon, feel free to drop me an email at the aforementioned email address and I'll give you a free download token for this bonus episode so that you can hear the response to the call that you were so kind enough to send in. This month's callers are Michael from Mountain View, Lindy in Eureka, Eddie from Phoenix, Ken from Columbus, Carl from Washington, Brent from Prosper, John from Germany, Eric from Australia, Chris from Orlando, Pedro from Spain, and Rich from Seattle. So feel free to drop me a line to each one of you. And for now, let's get started with Damon from Northbrook, Illinois, on the whole uh, ventilated seats issue in the S and the X. I've been talking in recent weeks about are they any good? You know, why does Tesla not offer them anymore, etc. Here's Damon. Hey, Ryan, this is Damon out in Northbrook, Illinois again. Just calling in regards to episode 251. You asked for listeners with ventilated seats to call in. I have a 2016 Model X 7 passenger where the front row is ventilated. And I'm pretty sure the reason that the feature went away is because it just wasn't very well implemented. Uh, you barely feel it unless you're wearing like mesh shorts and a light T-shirt. And even then, it's not really strong enough to be uh, appreciated. I think if they were to do a bigger mesh or stronger fans or something that it would be a feature worth having since the air conditioner does take a fair amount of uh, energy to run. But in its current implementation in my car, it's, it's not worth it. Um, a neat tip on the Model X that I think is kind of a bit of a hidden feature is the middle passenger seat is fully adjustable like the side passenger seats, but it's not apparent because on the side passenger seats, there's the conventional L-shaped buttons for tilting and moving forward and backward. 
uh, I thought that the only way to adjust the middle row was from the touch screen, but there's actually a button where your calves rest against the seat. It's a flush circular button and isn't uh, contrasting in any way. You have to just kind of bump into it to find it, which is how we did it. And it allows you to tilt the seats, not only move them forward and back, which is the only option the center touch screen has. So hope that helps anyone with older Model Xs with the third seat in the middle. All right. Well, love the show. Keep it up. Great work and take care. Damon, thank you for that real world feedback on the ventilated seats on the Patreon bonus episode that I mentioned a minute ago. I played a couple of callers who have those ventilated seats in their SRX as well. And spoiler alert, both of them echoed your statement. I realize that's a small sample size, just three people, but out of those three listeners who chimed in about the cooled seats in the S and X, not only did all three of them say that they weren't very good, none of you even remotely came close to endorsing them. So Tesla must have realized that too. And so they're gone for now. Hopefully they're going to come back with an improved version at some point in the future. Again, as I, I think I said when I talked about this topic uh, initially, the Roadster prototype has ventilated seats, so there's a good chance they'll come back in the Halo car if they don't already come back to the Model S and X sooner than that. Uh, as for your Model X tip, Damon, that is a good one. Thank you very much. I don't know if this would apply to the more recent five seat or seven seat bench option on the X, because I know that Tesla has changed that second row seat design a bit, but for the earlier seven seat versions for sure, that is a really good note to pass along since it sounds like it's a pretty well hidden adjustment. I, I mean, I don't own an X, but I did not know about that. Thank you again, Damon. Joe from Crown Point, Indiana is up next with a response to a previous caller. Joe, take it away. Hey, Ryan, this is Joe from Crown Point or Joey Donuts on social media. Um, I'm responding to a call you had from Chris from Charlotte who asked about a better uh, way to review the sentry mode footage where it would possibly skip to the event um, that is in question instead of having to scrub through the whole 10 minute uh, recording. So for Android users, and I don't know if it's come over to Apple yet, but there's actually an app called Tesla Cam Reviewer that does exactly that. Um, it will skip exactly, there's a button you can hit that says skip to event, and it will skip exactly to the moment in which it detected that sentry mode uh, went off. And that's very helpful because I can go through videos in 10 seconds and delete them immediately if I have to. Uh, there's also another feature where you can view the footage at up to, I believe, four times speed. So oftentimes uh, I'll just put it at four times speed if it's a uh, particular event that has a lot of foot traffic, regardless of the actual event that was triggering. Um, and I'll just watch the whole thing at four times speed and then maybe scrub through a little with my finger. And it's very useful. Uh, I, I have been using the in-car one. Just just because it's more convenient right now than having to eject the disc, but it is definitely helpful if you have a lot of footage to go through in a short amount of time. That app is great, and I hope Tesla will possibly contact those developers or straight up steal the idea because I think that is a really neat feature. All right, thanks. Bye. Joe, thank you. That is an excellent public service announcement. I appreciate you sharing that. I took a look, and I didn't see it on iOS, so this one appears to be for you Android users only for now. Uh, and I'm with you. They should just buy that software from the creator if it's indeed as useful as you say. I mean, why not? I've certainly got no reason to doubt you on that as well. So Android folks out there, you might want to go check that out. Thanks again, Joe. Next is Todd from Cleveland to talk about the paint protection package that Tesla just put on sale in their online store. Todd, go ahead. Hey, Ryan, it's Todd in Cleveland. I just had a quick question for you, see if you may know the answer to this. I saw that the winner or the paint protection package um, is now available on the website to everyone. It's the, the mud flaps, and um, then there's also a, looks like a paint film for the back. Um, I was kind of looking at this today and wondering if anyone... Um, could predict or have any information on the impact those mud flaps may have on range. I mean, I know we talk about, it seems like a little thing, but we talk about hubcaps and mirrors and the impact that has on range. 
Um, any thoughts on, on what adding those mud flaps may do? Um, you know, I'm a little torn. I, you know, I want the flaps, uh, to protect my paint. Uh, but of course it's the winter time when I'm most concerned about it. And uh, that's also when I have the most issues with range in my car right now. Um, and they don't look like the kinds of things you can take on or off. Looks like you actually have to cut a little piece of the rocker trim to get them to go on. So, uh, before I pull the trigger on that, I thought I'd, uh, throw it out to you and your in the audience to see if anybody has any thoughts on that thanks again for all you do love the podcast excellent question here todd so i asked my friend trevor from the tesla owners online forums who lives in toronto and is the only person i know who has these installed on his car meaning the only person i know i know there are plenty of people that that have it but my only friend that has them installed and uh, so i wrote to him and he said quote it doesn't affect range. And he's been driving with them for a while. So I would say if you are interested, go for it. Thank you to Todd and tip of the cap to Trevor as well. Will from Ancaster, another frequent caller. Good to hear from Will. He is up next to talk about autopilot. Will, you're on the air. Hey, Ryan. It's Will from Ancaster. Uh, been a while. Um, the last couple of weeks, you guys have been talking about how you had to disengage your autopilot. Um, to change lanes and whatnot, and I found that odd because I have never had to do that in my S or my X, and uh, my S is in the shop right now. I got a Model 3 for the first time, uh, it's my first experience in one. It's definitely uh, different, uh, some pluses, some minuses compared to the S. I think I'm happy with the S, but uh, anyway, uh, the 3 does the exact same thing that you're talking about, so um, I'm not sure if that's uh, something that they changed and implemented only in the newer vehicles or if it's the newer hardware or what, but uh, yeah, I have to disable the uh, the autopilot in order to change lanes and stuff, and I found that weird, so I just thought I would uh, chime in and say I'm with you. It's kind of frustrating. I much prefer the, uh, the S and the X where I literally just hit the turnstock and it changes lanes uh, for me, um, but uh, anyway... Still love the podcast. Have a great one. Ciao. Will, my guess here is that your S and X have enhanced autopilot, meaning you bought them in 2018 or earlier. If I remember correctly, the change that I've been talking about happened with the switch to basic autopilot being bundled in for quote unquote free again, because the price of the cars actually went up a couple thousand dollars to more or less compensate for it. Anyway, uh, but the... Uh, at that same time, the full self-driving package was made into the only package that you could add on. Now, if that's not the case, and your S and X are both new, please let me know, because then that would make this a little extra strained. So, uh, thank you very much, Will. Lawton from Chicago is next to talk about the I, the prospect, I should say, more, it's not even an idea, it's happening, the prospect of the subscription-based full self-driving purchase option. Go ahead, Lawton. Hi, Ryan. It's Lawton from Chicago. Want to comment on how full self-driving subscriptions are a win-win for both drivers and Tesla alike. Scripts are positive for drivers as it gives the ability to test drive features without a seven and soon to be $8,000 commitment and the flexibility to activate when needed. What made the best feature of both drivers and Tesla is the ability to offer subscription bundles. Since Tesla has data that false self driving lowers accident rates, it makes sense to offer a bundle with false self driving and insurance. They could add in premium connectivity with possible additional features such as live dash cam feeds with customized intelligent alerts to your phone. These alerts could utilize the neural net to analyze dash cam footage to determine whether your vehicle is in danger or has been damaged. This bundle will offer drivers a tremendous combination of value, convenience, safety, and security, and the financial benefit for Tesla of stable, predictable, high-margin subscription revenue. For an extra dessert, hopefully without a subscription, it would be amazing if they could get William Daniels, the voice of Kit from Night Rider, to give voice to our Teslas. Can't wait to hear from Tesla when my October 2018 Model 3 will be eligible for the Hardware 3 upgrade to join in on all the full self-driving fun. Thank you for your honest, heartfelt takes of all the important Tesla news, good and bad, every week. Look forward to your thoughts. I like your thinking here, Lawton. I never even thought about the idea of using the data to sync up Tesla insurance 
and the full self-driving subscription in a package like that. It does make a lot of sense. It's, and I'll tell you, it's yet another potential benefit of Tesla's vertical integration. It's gonna be interesting to see if Tesla, in fact, in practice, gets this creative when that full self-driving subscription option rolls out, supposedly, later this year, as we were last updated on it by Elon. Thanks, as always, for your call, Lawton. And let me go next uh, across the border to Mike from Ottawa, who uh, has a, a white interior question. Go ahead, Mike. Hey, Ryan. It's uh, Mike from Ottawa here. Um, just wondering if you ever found out how to get rid of the seatbelt marks on the interior, uh, more specifically the white interior. I know you were talking about um, how there's black marks on the white interior. And uh, again, uh, sorry if you've already mentioned this before, but uh, I haven't heard it on any of your podcasts recently. If you found a way to get rid of those black marks. All right. Thanks. And uh, always uh, looking forward to every Sunday to uh, listen to your podcast. Always appreciate uh, your positive vibes and uh, keep up the great work. Hey, Mike. Well, I imagine that perhaps your car has suffered the same issue if you're calling in about it. Well, to answer your question, and I, <laughs> this this uh, this dredges up the, the one real genuinely negative Tesla experience I've had with Tesla service. It never got solved for me. When I took it to the service center, and I, I tell you, I politely but firmly pressed them on it. First, they, uh, they, they brought over one of their detailers who tried to use like some kind of Meguiar's interior cleaner to try and get it off. Didn't come off. So they said, okay, well, this is, there's clearly a, a literally deeper issue here. I'd like, can I file a warranty claim for this? And uh, they, I was told that there is a six-month window on those kinds of issues. And I think at that point, the car was nine or 10 months old, something like that. So yeah, that abrasion, that, that seatbelt mark is still on my car, on, the, on the, the passenger rear side where my daughter sits. I even took it after that. I took it to Immaculate Reflections, a professional detailer, uh, I, I promise I'm not just trying to give him a plug here. Like that, he, He's the professional detailer that I know. I took it out to him, and he couldn't fix it. It is abraded into the seat. No product will get rid of it. Because this, if anybody, if, <laughs> if anybody was going get, to get it out, it was going to be Jeff at Immaculate Reflections. So I have to tell you that, again, this is the one issue so far. I'm almost two years into my ownership that this is the, the one issue so far that I'm just legitimately not happy with Tesla about. Uh, they, I, I haven't brought it up on the show because what is there to do? I mean, they, I, I tried, they rejected me, and it just is what it is. So, you know, what am I going to do? So um, uh, they were, to me, they were presented with the problem in good faith. They wouldn't address it. Uh, I've seen uh, I've seen other people who've run into this. I know I'm not the only white interior Model Three owner who's run into this, but I'll tell you if <laughs> if I ever do get the chance to sit down with Elon and interview him again, I might f- try to bring it up. I mean, I, the the first time <laughs> the first time I interviewed him, well, the, the only time so far, I was so just focused on maximizing the limited amount of time and and trying to do a good interview. But this time, I'm if I were to get another chance. I might try to sneak that in either at the beginning or at the end. But anyway, uh, the point is, I wish I had better news to report on this, Mike, but sadly, I do not. Al from Florida is up next. Let's brighten the mood a little bit. Uh, Al talking Model Y versus Model 3 here. Go ahead, Al. Hey, Ryan. Al from Florida again. Um, Still contemplating which Tesla to get, but it's getting closer. About uh, two months ago or so, I rented a Model 3 for the weekend and drove about 350 miles with it and did a lot of different things with it and thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, Two weeks ago, I got a chance to test drive a Model Y, and there are differences. Number one, as far as the the ride height is much higher, as we all know, with the Tesla, I found it much easier to get into the car because it was higher. I found the leg room in the front and the rear seats. Um, I don't know if it's that much different, but it sure seemed that way. Headroom was much bigger as well, much more comfortable in that regard. 
Um, the uh, side view mirrors on the Model 3 I thought were tiny and really – I really didn't like them. I thought they were a little bit hard to see on the side, but the Model Y is definitely bigger. gives you better field of vision. And as far as the hatch, you know, distance between the, the rear seat and the end of the car is very similar in both cars, but that hatch just opens up that whole back area from a storage point of view. I know there's a bunch of other small differences between both vehicles, but uh, when I do pull the trigger, it's definitely going to be a Model Y. And anybody who's... Uh, you know, looking for those differences, the Model Y definitely gives you some extra ones. By the way, the Model 3 I test drove was a rear rear wheel drive, um, long range, and the Model Y was a performance. Uh, so obviously the the, the startup uh, speed was a little bit quicker in the performance, but heck, I'm not going to be going to a racetrack anytime soon. They're both plenty quick. Anyway, have a great day. Enjoy your podcast. Bye bye. Al, I appreciate your call here because I imagine there are plenty of your fellow listeners out there who are either weighing the same decision now or are going to be weighing that same decision at some point relatively soon, and thus your experience will probably be of use to other people hearing this. I'm really glad that you were able to take the time to try both cars. I know it's, you know, it's... It's, you got to, you're taking a significant amount of time out of your, your day to do that. And, and in your case, you said you rented a three, so you went to some expense as well. But that is the ideal ultimate way to go if you can. Uh, and I'll tell you, you've got one up on me. I have not yet been able to drive a Model Y, although one of these days... I will take up, there's a local listener who's reached out uh, uh, with an offer to come and, and uh, drive his. And when all of this, when, when we can get back to a little bit more of a sense of normalcy, I, I look forward to taking him up on that. But anyway, I hope you are able to get your Model Y soon, Al. And, uh, you, I, you know, you've, you've been kind enough to call and kind of ask questions along the way and be curious and, and inquisitive and, and do the work and, and uh, really figure out what was the best car for you. You've done the research to know that you are going to be buying the best Tesla for your needs. So well done, Al. Uh, next, Mike from Maryland responding to Keith the Tesla Hillbilly about the idea of the towable battery. Go ahead, Mike. Hi, Brian. Mike from Maryland. In uh, response to the Tesla Hillbilly, in his question about the longer battery uh, availability for the Cybertruck, uh, in a way, uh, it, it, all, it has an infinite battery size. If you recall, they were going to put a solar panel over top of the vault to uh, give you about another 15 miles per day. And if you go for the umbrella option, I think that was like maybe 100 miles a day. That, that was going to basically, uh, br- you know, uh, spread out to, to, for people who are camping, uh, just for the kind of situation where he was talking about. Okay, uh, hope this uh, hope this all finds you well, and uh, talk to you later. Thank you, Mike. Those will definitely help. Although respectfully, I'm not sure I would call it infinite. I mean, as you mentioned, Elon said the solar vault cover when whenever that's available, because that might not be right at launch. It could come months or or a year or two down the road. We'll see but that that solar vault cover might add about 15 miles of range per day. That's not too much. You would burn that off real quick on the road en route to your remote camping destination. And the solar tent of sorts for camping that you can see the render of on the the Cybertruck page on the Tesla website, that definitely might be able to self-power you for as long as your camping trip lasts, but obviously, that's not going to be usable when you're actually driving the truck. Still, though, the possibilities for the Cybertruck are just endlessly fascinating. It's really cool just thinking of all the interesting ideas and ways that this truck could be put to use in ways that the other vehicles in the Tesla lineup cannot be. So I can't wait to see what accessories Tesla offers and how this truck handles all of the very unique real-world scenarios that people are going to throw at it. Thanks for your call. Thanks to everybody for your calls this week. 
If you have got something to say as it pertains to Tesla, maybe a response to one of the calls you heard, a response to something I said uh, earlier in the show, or just something on your mind in the world of Tesla, drop me a line. I gave you the two easy ways to call in earlier at the uh, top of this segment, I should say. Stick with me though, I'll be right back with a video game suggestion for you, a pro tip of the week, and some parting thoughts right after this. Well, I have to tell you, I am at the point where I am itching to go for a longer drive in the car. I haven't charged it higher than 60% in many weeks because it's barely being driven. Thankfully, I happen to have, uh, I, <laughs> almost as if hearing my my thoughts, a friend of mine from out of town uh, is is looking at a car here uh, that's, that, he's, that he's interested in, and it's across the bay. It's like a 45 minute drive from here. And he reached out to me and said, hey, would you mind going to look at this car for me? It's not a Tesla. But I said, sure, yeah, I'll, I'm happy to go take a look. Cause it's, I sort of talked it over with my wife and it's like, yeah, I can, it's a, it's a socially distanced activity. I just go and, and uh, the person can, the owner can let me into the car and I can check it out, take all the pictures and things I need and, and uh, not have any you know, close contacts, so, all right. And so, yeah, I'm actually stoked that, that it's 45 minutes away. So right now I've upped my charge limit and I've got the car set to, to charge back up to 90%, which is, that's when I have the, the most power. You know, the, the higher you charge the, the Performance 3, the higher the state of charge, the more oomph you've got in the horsepower department. So if I find a, you know, an on, a quiet on-ramp or, a, or you know, the, the right quiet situation, safe situation. I might, uh, might have to hit the old accelerator. So I'm looking forward to taking the car out for a nice, what I guess will be in total, like an hour and a half cruise this weekend. That should be fun. Anyway, uh, real quick, if you're still at home, working from home, what have you, and you're looking for some more entertainment options. Again, I work in the field of video games. I cover video games for a living is uh, in the form of enthusiast media for IGN. So I've got a video game recommendation for you this week, and it is the Bioshock Collection, it, which, uh, which is a, a remastered collection of the three Bioshock games that have been done thus far. There's Bioshock, Bioshock 2, and Bioshock Infinite. And I'll tell you, the original alone is worth it. The original Bioshock from 2007 is a tremendous video game, one of the best examples of storytelling in video games. I won't tell you what happens, of course, but I'll say if you stick with that video game, it is uh, the story goes to some really interesting places. And I'll tell you, the art direction is phenomenal. It's set in this sort of idyllic uh, underwater city. It's really cool. So the Bioshock Collection which is available for Xbox One, PlayStation 4, or PC. Definitely recommend it. And as for a pro tip of the week this week, let's go to an old friend, Joe from New York. A pro tip about the supercharger map in your Tesla. Joe, take it away. Hey, Ryan, it's Joe from New York. Just wanted to leave you a pro tip for those that are new to using the supercharger map uh, inside your Tesla. Uh, when you click on the uh, supercharge icon uh, by clicking on the map and clicking on it uh, lower right, you'll see that the superchargers show up in two shades of red. One is a bright red and the other is a faded red. Uh, what's the difference? The difference is the bright ones are the ones that you'll make it to on your current state of charge. The gray ones, you're not going to make it to there. So uh, beware when you choose where you're going to supercharge along your trip. Joe, that is a very good pro tip. That's right in the spirit of the segment. Thank you so much. And by the way, again, I remind you all, if you've got a pro tip of the week, I would very much love it if you would send it in the very same way that you send in the rest of the phone calls. Something interesting that you've discovered about your car, a shortcut, an Easter egg, uh, what have you, anything like that, send it my way and I will share it with the Ride the Lightning audience. 
All right, before I go, just some deals and friends to mention. Deals for you, friends of the show. Uh, first, you've got abstractocean.com offering all kinds of good stuff, whether it's tempered glass screen protectors, those gorgeous center console wraps and all the different colors and styles they've got, the Roadster style T-E-S-L-A lettering that you could do on the back of your Model 3. They've got uh, all the great lighting kits for the interior of your car as well. Check it all out, abstractocean.com. And if you decide to buy anything, my advice is uh, buy everything you're going to buy that, that, you're, that you're interested in at once because there is a one-time use coupon code for first-time shoppers that are listeners of this podcast. Use the coupon code RTL Podcast at checkout to get 15% off of your first order. Meanwhile, uh, we've got my friend Jeff at Immaculate Reflections, the aforementioned uber professional detailer. He is fantastic. He is sanitary. He runs a very clean operation. It's all, uh, you know, no touch. It's touchless drop-off, pickup. Uh, he'll take good care of you and your car. He's got uh, discounts for listeners of this podcast. Wh whether you want to do, well, really any any range of services or or combine some services, there's, of course, ceramic coating, there's paint correction, paint protection film. Maybe you want to do just the front of the car. You don't have to do the whole car, but maybe do that uh, that front end. So that's where all the, the, the bulk of the rock chips are going to come your way. So get in touch about those discounts. Get in touch about getting on his schedule and booking in with him. You can do that on his website, irdetailing.com. You can also look up his work on Yelp at yelp.com slash immaculate reflections and on Instagram where his handle is immaculate underscore reflections. If you are interested in wireless cell phone charging in your Model 3, since all the Model Ys come with it by default, I would highly recommend a Jada wireless charging pad. I use one myself. I've got version 2, though, and they just came out with version 3 that has uh, it's made of an even nicer, grippier material. Uh, the power output is up. It can actually charge faster than the version 2 one could. So if you are interested in that, or if you've got a 3 or a Y, they have the USB hub, which fits really just perfectly into the forwardmost part of the front of the center console in the car. Gives you some additional USB ports, four USB hub, uh, USB A ports for the Model Y version, two USB C, uh, and then the the Model Three one is similar. So you got plenty more USB port action. Uh, plus, more. I think the coolest feature of the USB hub is I've mentioned this before, but the magnetized, the, the hidden dummy door at the back of it that you can, if you know what you're doing, which you would as the owner, you can push that away and take that that fake dummy wall off, and you can hide your sentry mode, your 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 USB stick back there that you use for your sentry mode, so that. Heaven forbid if anything ever did happen to your car, and heaven forbid that that person that did the bad thing to your car actually knew to, to take the USB stick, which is the evidence that recorded the person, well, they probably wouldn't be able to, to know how to get through that, uh, that USB hub. So anyway, if you're interested in either of those, please use my referral link, I humbly ask, because uh, in full transparency, the Jada folks toss a couple bucks my way from, from the sale if you purchase through my referral link. So that referral link is getjada.com. That's Jada spelled J-E-D-A. Getjada.com slash R-E-F slash eight. You've got to use the slash R-E-F slash eight. And then uh, speaking of the dash cam and the sentry mode, the one-stop solution for that is puretesla.com slash RTL that uses a micro SD based solution, which is designed for the constant reading and writing that uh, USB is very much not designed for. So it's, it's just a simple kit that comes uh, ready to go right out of the package for you. Free shipping anywhere in the US. It's $49 for the 128 gigabyte kit, which is what I'm using. Or you can step up and go with the 256 gigabyte kit 
for $69 if you like on that. Works with Mac or PC. Again, free shipping anywhere in the U.S., uh, though they will ship anywhere in the world. And the link again, puretesla.com slash RTL. Finally, I would like to, of course, humbly mention my Patreon. That is how you can most support the podcast, most directly support the podcast. Don't get me wrong. I don't take your, your listenership for granted. That alone is obviously supporting it. But uh, I do put a lot of time, a lot of energy a lot of research and love into this podcast, a lot of enthusiasm into it each week. And if you are able to support me uh, in these strange times, I would be extra humbled and extra appreciative uh, because every bit really does make a difference. So if you're curious to learn more about that or make a pledge, you can go to patreon.com slash Tesla podcast, Patreon spelled P A T. R-E-O-N, and depending on which tier you decide to pledge at, you know, I throw some cool little bonuses on there, like the, the bonus episode that I mentioned earlier in the podcast. So there's there's some extra little little things there to try and make it uh, a little, some nice little rewards for your support, basically. If you are not already subscribing to the podcast, I would highly encourage you to do so, because that way you don't have to remember to go get the podcast every week it will come and politely knock on your door. You can subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, which is, yes, in your Tesla. So you can get this podcast in your Tesla. Uh, I guess you do need the premium connectivity for that now, now that that's all changed. But anyway, it's there if, uh, if you do indeed have the premium connectivity. I'm also on Spotify, if you prefer to listen that way, and on YouTube as well, just as audio only. There's you're, you're, the video, the, I use air quotes, video is just the show logo, but it is there if uh, listening on YouTube is convenient for you. Just search on YouTube for Ride the Lightning Tesla, and you'll find my channel no problem, and you could subscribe to it easily from there. That, I think, will about do it. Again, you can email me anytime, teslapodcast at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter or Instagram if you're interested. Both are the same handle, DMC underscore Ryan. And before I go, let me, of course, thank the wonderful Patreon producers. These folks are uh, supporting at a tier that includes a shout-out in the credits, so to speak, of the portion of the podcast, which is now. I want to welcome back Jerome Strack. Thank you so much for uh, your returning support, Jerome. Sincerely appreciated. Along with uh, Pete White, Wolfgang Obergen, George Cassiopo, David Brander, Jonathan Wales, Alexi Heft, Logan Willis, Robert Maracle, Jason Chalukas, Joe Edgel, Tim Hyde, Lawton from Chicago, Peter Chalet, David Vakil, Ulrich Lassa, Luke A., Eric Randolph, David Nondahl, Jerry and Mary Smith, Brian Hope, Bill Royko, Lyle Austin, Joel Sapp, Dory and Steve Guberman, Daniel Grummer, Jeremy, Tesla Owners Taiwan, Jeremy Harris, Rob Brewer, Ron Lee, Chris Konesnik, John Cody, Matthew Wright, Charlie Gillespie, Kaz Barnes, Neil Weaver, David Perella, Sunil Joseph, Dennis Peak, Will Stedman, Evie Tricity UK, Stig Mickey Jensen, Jeff Angwin, Chase Cabanillas, Richard Folkers, Matt Kalen, Trenton from Myrtle Beach, The Lydia Family, Michael Regal, Mark Eversoll, Ish, Ramey from TeslaProTips.com, Chris Beach, Aaron Altschul, Steve Radspinner, and Jared Brown. Thank you all very much, sincerely, for your continued support, particularly at that producer tier. All right, for a passed out puppy over there, Daisy the Boxer, my name is Ryan McCaffrey. Of course, this was Ride the Lightning episode 254. I wish you a safe, happy, and healthy week, and I will see you again next week. New show every Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific. I mean, I think a Tesla 
is the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. That's what it's meant to be. Our goal is to make it's it's not exactly a car. It's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. It's maximum fun. 